So in this video, I'm going to cover what will be covered on quiz four. So quiz four will cover our nitrate reduction test. It will cover our pH demo, our osmotic pressure, so the effect of osmotic pressure on microbial growth, the effect of temperature on microbial growth, steam sterilization, the Kirby-Bauer test, protozoans, membrane filter test, so basically your water sample testing, um, and LTB and BGLB. And so we're gonna go into detail for each of these sections. What is it that you need to study? So next we come to our nitrate reduction test. What you wanna understand for your nitrate reduction test is the purpose, right? And the purpose is to determine whether bacteria can use nitrate, NO3 minus, as the final electron acceptor during anaerobic respiration. Again, I can't stress that enough. It's not aerobic. Aerobic is using O2 as the final electron acceptor. In this test, we're determining if nitrate can take this place, if nitrate can act as the final electron acceptor during anaerobic respiration. So you wanna know the purpose. And you wanna know that this nitrate being the final electron acceptor takes place in the electron transport chain. So in metabolism, right, the final electron acceptor is gonna be in the electron transport chain. And again, that's covered in lecture in the metabolism chapter. So on this slide, what you wanna know is your biochemical sheet. And that is that your substrate is gonna be your nitrate, NO3 minus. Your enzyme is nitrate reductase. This is an endoenzyme. You want to study your product, which is your nitrite. And you wanna understand that going from nitrate to nitrite is a reduction, right? Remember that if it loses oxygen, um, it's a reduction, right? Oxidation would be a gain of oxygen. Losing oxygen uh, would be a reduction. So this is a reduction reaction. So you wanna know this. Um, you wanna know the reagents, right? So the reagent that detects the nitrite is the reagents A and B. So reagents A and B detect nitrite, and when nitrite is detected, they turn red. You wanna know the difference between the ammonification, meaning we fully reduce it to ammonium, NH4 positive, or denitrification, and that denitrification is producing nitrogen gases. And so this is going to be the loss of biologically available nitrogen because it's going to be released as those nitrogen gases. And so you wanna know that these are your nitrogen gases, but again, you don't need to memorize that NO is nitric oxide and N2O is nitrous oxide. Just know that these produce um, nitrogen gases. Now you want to review this slide because in this slide we walked through and we talked about uh, what is the positive in this test and what is the negative. Remember that there's only really one true negative and that is that it's red after the addition of zinc. Because what that means is that nitrate was still in the broth and the zinc reduced the nitrate to nitrite, which is why it turned red. So you really want to go back and review this slide and make sure that you understand all the different parts. Like why is it red after reagents A and B? Why is that a positive? Why can't we stop at no red after reagents A and B. What are the two possibilities, right? So we wrote down the two possibilities for why it would be not red. And so that's why we have to add the zinc. You wanna know that the zinc is a reducing agent. It's going to artificially reduce any nitrate still in the broth to nitrite. You want to know how do we distinguish between denitrification and ammonification. And again, it's looking for gas in the Durham tube. And so you really want to study this slide and make sure you know what the different colors tell you. If we ask you questions related to this, we will tell you this tube has reagents A and B and zinc, or this tube only had reagents A and B. So we'll tell you what's in the tubes, and then based on the color, you need to tell me what your interpretation of that would be. You also want to go back, and you might recall that when I talked about this nitrate reduction test, 
that I had you guys answer the questions in the question sets um, that were related to this. And I would highly recommend going back and reviewing those. Um, there were a set of questions also that talked about for an uninoculated tube, if you added the different reagents, what color would you expect them to be and why? Go back and review those as well because that's testing your knowledge to see do you understand how this test works. So go back and review um, the questions that are in the question sets that I had you go over together um, in class. And so that is the other thing you really want to study for this one. So again, you want to know what the function of the zinc is, right? And that zinc is an artificial reducing agent. And basically, if any nitrate is left in the media, the zinc, instead of the nitrate reductase, the zinc will artificially reduce the nitrate to nitrite. And if it turns red after the zinc, that means that the bacteria don't use the nitrate. The zinc reduced it to nitrite, which is why it turned red. If it remains clear, it tells us that full reduction of nitrate occurred because we still have no nitrite. And so it's either ammonification or denitrification. And so that's what you want to understand. You kind of want to understand this is a more complex readout and you want to understand what this readout tells you. So the next test that we're going to cover is looking at the effect of pH and osmotic pressure on microbial growth. So this was a demonstration that would have been set up in the back of the classroom. And so what we did was we had three different bacteria and we inoculated them into different pH broths and then looked at at which pH did they grow. So if we were to look at the um, information for lactobacillus, again, remember that it grew best at around pH 2 and then somewhat at pH 4 a little bit less at pH 6, and not at all at, at pH 8 or 10. So as a result, we would say that this bacteria is an acidophile. It grows best at a low pH. And so what you want to be able to do is if shown a picture like this, you want to be able to look at that picture and see at which pH did it grow and based on those pHs, you would want to say whether it is an acidophile, a neutrophile, or an alkalophile. And so that's what you really want to be able to take home from the pH experiment. Um, in terms of organisms to know, use your organisms to know list to help you study to see if there are organisms you need for this experiment and for the osmotic pressure. If it's on the list, you need to know it. Um, and so, for this one, it grows at the acidic pH, so therefore this bacteria would be an acidophile. If we look at Staph aureus, you'll notice that it grew at a pH of 6, at a pH of 8, and somewhat at a pH of 4. So we would say that Staph aureus is a neutrophile, grows best around a neutral pH. If we look at Alcaligenes faecalis, Alkaligenes faecalis grew best at a pH of 8 and 10, a little bit at 6, so notice that it grew better at the alkaline pHs, so we would call this an alkalophile. It grows best at the high pH. In terms of the osmotic pressure, so we had two bacteria that were inoculated in different salt concentrations. And so Staphylococcus aureus grew at all of the salt concentrations tested from 2% up to 11%. And as a result, we would refer to this as osmotolerant. This bacteria is osmotolerant because it lives on the skin and salt concentrations can change. And so it can live in a variety of different salt concentrations. For E. coli, E. coli could only grow at a narrow window of salt concentrations. It lives in the gut and can't tolerate salt. So if I look at Staph aureus again, notice that it grew 2%, 5%, 8%, 11%. And so since we see growth at all of these salt concentrations, we would say that Staph aureus is osmotolerant. So it grows at a range of salt concentrations. E. coli, on the other hand, E. coli grew at 2% salt, 
a little bit at 5%, but not at all at 8 or 11. So we would say that E. coli is not osmotolerant. It's not able to tolerate high salt concentrations. And so not osmotolerant. So again, for this, you just need to be able to look at a series of tubes and to be able to say whether or not the bacteria is going to be osmotolerant. In terms of your effect on temperature, so what you want to take away from this is that uh, different bacteria have different temperature ranges. You want to know the general range that each of these uh, temperature requirements grows at. And what I mean by that is that you should know that psychrophiles, for example, can grow below freezing. It can grow in the refrigerator and in fact actually grows optimally in the refrigerator, but doesn't really grow at room temperature. You want to know that your psychrotrophs, right, psychrotrophs means cold eater, those can grow at refrigeration temperature and room temperature, but often not at human body temperature. And so there are very few psychrotrophs that are pathogenic. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Mesophiles, right? These are moderate lovers. They grow at room temperature. They grow at body temperature. They grow a little higher than body temperature as well. And so those would be your mesophiles. Thermophiles, thermo means heat, right? These are our heat lovers. They grow not at human body temperature. So again, many thermophiles don't cause disease because they don't grow at our body. Um, so they grow above uh, 40 up to about 80. And then extreme thermophiles up to boiling temperatures. So again, you don't have to memorize an exact number per se, but you wanna have an overall sense as to what types of temperatures, meaning refrigeration, room temperature, body temperature, freezing, etc. And so that's what you want to take away from this one. Now we did this experiment. Um, you don't have to memorize all of these numbers or all of these pluses that we put in here. But again, you should know, for example, Pseudomonas fluorescence grew at the 5 and the 25. Um, that is going to be your psychrotroph if it grows at those temperatures. So that would give you your term over here. When you're studying, you'll notice for your list of organisms to know, right, your list of organisms to know, it's not Pseudomonas fluorescence. Uh, we want the pathogenic example. And the pathogenic example that we talked about is Listeria monocytogenes. And so you want to know that this is the example organism um, for a psychrotroph and it causes listeriosis. And so in lecture as well, um, I did talk about listeria being a psychrotroph and a little bit about the disease. So it might be a good idea also to review about listeriosis, like which group of people are most at risk, um, how do you typically contract it, meaning it's typically from eating unpasteurized um, cheese or drinking unpasteurized milk or deli products, etc. So you do want to understand for this one a little bit, a little bit about the disease. Um, I talked about it in the lab video, but I also talked a lot about it in the lecture video as well. Um, if you see growth at uh, around um, room temperature and human body and possibly a little higher, so in these three ranges, those would both be your mesophiles. And again, you want to go off your organism to know list to know which organism you want to study, um, as well as the disease that it causes. Um, Bacillus sterothermophilus, right? That was the one that grew at 55 only, and we would call that a thermophile. So for the steam sterilization, you want to know the purpose, and the purpose is to determine if the autoclave is working properly to sterilize the instruments. And so you wanna know that to do this, we use an autoclave, which is our big pressure cooker. And these are the minimum operating conditions. And so it's 120 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes at 15 PSI, which is pounds per square inch, which has to do with the amount of pressure. And so we test this by putting in these little kilot ampules, which you'll see in the next slide. And so we run our autoclave with our killet ampule. And then after the autoclave is ran, we place our killet ampule at 55 degrees Celsius 
for 48 hours to see if the endospores were killed. And so let's talk about what's in the killet ampule. So for the seam sterilization, you want to know what is in the killet ampule. And so we have our Bacillus sterothermophilus, which is there as an endospore because it's our heat resistant organism that we are determining if the autoclave can sterilize the endospores. We have our bromocrassal purple, which is our pH indicator, which is purple when alkaline and yellow when acidic. We have glucose, which is there for fermentation. And so if the organism survives, it'll ferment the glucose, produce acidic products, and decrease the pH. And so you want to know when looking at a killet ampule, if that indicates if sterilization was successful or not. And so if we see a killet ampule that is yellow, yellow again means it's acidic. And what that means is that glucose was fermented and that sterilization failed, meaning that the autoclave did not sterilize it. It did not kill those endospores. The endospores germinated, they fermented the glucose, and they produced those acids. If, however, your killet ampule is purple, purple is going to be alkaline. And what that means is that glucose was not fermented and that the tube is sterile and that the organism died in the autoclave. So the autoclave was sufficient to basically um, kill and um, destroy those endospores. And so this is what you need to know for your steam sterilization. Now, coming to our Kirby Bauer. This is our disc diffusion, also known as an antibiotic sensitivity test. The purpose of this test is to perform a culture and antibiotic sensitivity test on an organism. Now, I know I wasn't the one that provided this lecture for you, um, but these slides were covered. And during the office hours this next week, um, if you have questions about it, we can go over it. But I wanted to kind of walk through and talk about what are the things that you need to know from this section. So one, you want to know that this test is standardized, meaning that when this test is performed, there are several things that have to be kept constant in order for your results to be meaningful. And so the type of auger that we use is this Mueller Hinton auger. And then you want to know why do we use the auger at a pH of 7.2 to 7.4. So for example, that's the pH of the blood. These drugs are going to be in the blood, and therefore we want to test these antibiotics in the blood, right? We want to mimic the environment that they're in in the blood. And so you just want to go through and review for each of these parts um, what is the purpose of this being standardized? What does this control for? What does this mimic? And so that's what you want to study from this. In terms of your readout for Kirby Bauer, you want to know that you should measure the zone of inhibition, which is the clear to the clear. Now be careful, this one starts at zero and goes across, right? But this ruler could be set up where the two is here and it goes to the four. Know that what you're doing is you're recording this in um, millimeters. So this one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters. So if I was measuring this diameter across, right, it starts at the zero and it goes to three. So I would record this as 30 millimeters. So make sure you're measuring in millimeters. Now you want to understand these three levels of susceptibility. So that if the bacteria is sensitive, right, you're going to have a big clearing around the disc. And that tells us that a normal dose of the antibiotic would be effective. If, on the other hand, you get a readout of it being intermediate susceptibility, that means that a higher than normal dose of the antibiotic is required, right? And so the only reason you would choose a drug that has intermediate susceptibility is if bacteria are resistant to all the other drugs, right? If bacteria are resistant to everything else, but it's intermediate susceptibility to this one drug, that means that that drug has some effectiveness against the bacteria. Not enough to just give a standard dose, 
what that would tell you is if a physician saw that, you would know you need to give a higher than normal dose. So either the dose itself needs to be higher, maybe it's for an extended period of time, but you can't just give the standard dose and have it be effective. And so you want to know when do you choose to use an intermediate susceptible drug. And that is, again, if there's a uh, an antibiotic that the bacteria is sensitive to, well, you're going to choose the one that's sensitive. But if there is no sensitive antibiotic, then you would have to choose the intermediate susceptible drug and just know that you would need to use a higher than normal dose. The other um, level of susceptibility would be resistant. And what does it mean if bacteria is resistant? And that means that no acceptable dose of the antibiotic is effective. You can't use any dose that it would be considered safe um, and have it be effective. So you would not choose a drug that the bacteria is resistant to. And again, these are all relative to the Kirby Bauer being standardized. You have to have the test be standardized for these results to be meaningful. So you want to review this question that was posed, right? True or false, all bacteria found within the clear area around the discs are dead. So review this and understand why that's true or false. And also, is there a test you could do as a follow-up to distinguish between different possibilities? Could you do a test to distinguish if bacteria are actually dead in those clear zones? You want to know that those clear zones, again, are called your zones of inhibition. You do not need to memorize this table, okay? If on the exam we ask you to use a plate and to measure, you should be able to understand how to measure that, meaning if a ruler is given to you on a picture, um, if that ruler is given to you on a picture, you need to be able to know what to look for. So again, every centimeter is 10 millimeters. The little lines are the millimeters. So you want to be able to look at the ruler that's on the zone of inhibition and then compare that with um, this table. So if you were given this table and let's say you measured the P10 disc, this is what's written on the disc, the P10. If I measured P10 and let's say my um, zone of inhibition was 25, notice that 25 milliliters falls between 20 and 27. So if I'm at 25, I would record that the bacteria is intermediate susceptible to this drug, right? So you just need to be able to know how to look at the plate, measure the zone of inhibition, and then use the table, right, to determine if bacteria are resistant, intermediate susceptible, or sensitive to that drug. And so again, you do not need to memorize this table. It's going to be given to you if asked a question related to this. So some questions have come up about these tables and do you need to memorize this table or do you need to memorize the disinfectant antiseptic table? Answer is no. The idea for the disinfectant antiseptics, which is not even on quiz four, um, but the disinfectant antiseptics, it was just more for you to see different types of chemicals and how effective they were. But again, we're not going to test you. I'm not going to test you on you know, what type of ingredient is Clorox wipes. I don't care that you know if it's a halogen or a quaternary ammonium ion. You don't have to memorize that. You don't have to memorize the results, right? So that's not the takeaway. And same thing with this table. You don't need to memorize that um, clindamycin was only effective against Staph aureus. I don't care that you memorize that detail. So just be aware that when you're studying this, you don't have to memorize this table. What you do want to look at for this table, though, is you'll notice that these top or these uh, left three, they're all gram negative. And if you noticed in your total number of resistance that the gram negative were much more resistant than these three gram positives. And so you want to take away that from this is that the gram negative is more resistant than the gram positive. And you also want to have an idea of how do you know if a drug is narrow spectrum or broad spectrum, right? And so if you see that the um, bacteria, if multiple different bacteria are sensitive to this drug, right? So let's say, for example, uh, norfloxacin. 
Norfloxacin had sensitivity pretty much almost all the way across, except Pseudomonas. Um, and so if we were looking and we saw sensitive, sensitive, sensitive to both gram positive and gram negative, then you would say that that drug is broad spectrum. If, on the other hand, the drug is only effective against gram positive, right? So like penicillin is only effective against gram positive or clindamycin is only effective against staph aureus. If you saw that, you would want to know that that means that that drug is narrow spectrum. So again, you don't have to memorize what drugs are broad and narrow, but if given the data or given plates and they're labeled S's and R's for you, you should be able to look and say, well, that drug, um, in every case, the bacteria is sensitive. So that's broad spectrum. And if you only see some of them being affected, then that's going to be narrow spectrum. And so again, don't memorize this table. You don't need to get bogged down with that detail. But you want to understand if you were looking at this table or if you were looking at the plates, what do those plates tell you? So you want to study this slide. This is going to be useful for both um, lecture and lab. So you might as well study this now about which organisms are the most resistant to which organisms are the least resistant and why, what makes those organisms be more or less resistant. And so go back and review this. You want to know what it means to say that a drug is a broad spectrum versus a narrow spectrum, right? And broad kills or inhibits both gram positive and gram negative. Narrow spectrum kills only a specific type, like maybe it only affects gram positive in the case of penicillin, right? Um, and so you want to understand what those terms mean. You also want to have an idea of why do you choose a drug that is broad versus narrow? Like under what situation would you choose a broad spectrum? Basically pros and cons of each, right? And so broad spectrum, you would choose if your patient had some sort of, um, some sort of infection that would kill them very quickly, right? If they're in septic shock and let's say, um, let's say they needed a drug very quickly, then giving a broad spectrum would be the way to go because it should target, you don't have to wait to find out what's causing the infection, it should target that bacteria um, regardless of what it is. So that would be the advantage of using a broad spectrum. If you don't know what's causing the infection and the infection puts the patient in imminent danger, then you're gonna choose to use that broad spectrum. The drawback of a broad spectrum is that if you overuse a broad spectrum, you're not only getting rid of the bad bacteria, but you're getting rid of the good bacteria too. You're killing normal flora. And so you're killing the good bacteria. That can be problematic because that can lead to what's called a super infection. And that's an infection following a previous infection to a drug that's already been used. So basically it's that the bacteria become resistant um, because of the use of the broad spectrum. And so broad spectrum um, is not the way to go if you have time to figure out what's causing the infection. Narrow spectrum, right, is going to kill or inhibit only specific types. So if you have time to figure out what's causing the infection, well, then a narrow spectrum would be the way to go because you're not going to be getting rid of good normal flora bacteria right? And so that would be an advantage. Plus, narrow spectrum is also more targeted. So it's going to be more effective because it's targeting only the bacteria causing the infection. It's not um, being utilized by multiple different bacteria. So there are uses for both. There are cases where you need a broad spectrum. There are cases when you need a narrow spectrum. Neither one is necessarily better all the time. They have different uses. Sometimes broad's better, sometimes narrow is better. And so um, that's what you want to take away from this. You want to understand what is drug synergy. And drug synergy is that the two drugs combined is greater than either drug alone. So what does that look like on the plate? Again, you want to look for that um, enhanced synergy or this enhanced clearing between the two discs. So like on our plates, uh, the plates that were in the PowerPoint, 
the plates, if you looked at the disc for trimethoprim and the sulfa drugs, you would see that you get this enhanced clearing. It's greater than either drug alone, which tells you that the two drugs display synergy. Together, combined, they're more effective than either alone. And in the case of um, sulfa and trimethoprim, the reason that those two drugs are synergistic is that they both target the synthesis of folic acid. And they do so by targeting two different steps. And so combined, because they're both targeting the same pathway, um, combined, they do a much better job of inhibiting and shutting down that pathway than either drug alone. And if bacteria can't make folic acid, they can't make nucleic acids. And if they can't make nucleic acids, they can't divide. Um, and so you want to understand what is drug synergy? What does it mean to say that two drugs have drug synergy? And what would that look like on a plate? So if shown a plate, you should be able to identify which drugs display synergy by looking at this enhanced um, clearing between them. Membrane Feltzer technique, this was the video that was posted today. Um, so you want to go through and watch this video. Um, you want to know what the purpose of this test is. Um, you want to know that this test is presumptive. You want to know what does presumptive mean so that the results or data has a high confidence of accuracy. You want to know what a call form is. What are the three components that make something a call form? Gram-negative rod that ferments lactose to produce acids and gases. Um, you want to know examples, and I'll go through that more in a minute. You want to know why is it important to know if coliforms are in the water. And again, coliforms are an indicator of sewage or fecal contamination that may contain other pathogens as well. You want to understand kind of an overview of how the membrane filter setup works. And that is that we're using this nitrocellulose grid and that the nitrocellulose grid has pores that are 0.45 microns in size. So the holes are 0.45 micrometers in size and that most bacteria are between one to five micrometers. And so in the diagram, this little blue is the size of the pore and the red is the bacteria. And so the bacteria are much larger than the holes. They're not going to pass through the pores and they're going to end up being stuck on this filter. And then you can take this filter and put it on endo auger to see if there's bacteria that was in that water sample. So you want to know for the multiple tube fermentation that day one is using a laurel tryptose broth, what's called LTB. You also want to study for this part, this whole unit on water sample testing. You want to know, you don't have to know the entire recipes, but you do want to know for each of those types of media, what are the selective ingredients? And what are the differential ingredients? And how are they selective? What are they selecting for? Or what are they selecting against? So like in this example for LTB, um, LTB, the lactose is differential because we're looking at if bacteria can uh, use lactose, right? Ferment lactose to produce acids and gas. So that is our differential. Our sodium lauryl sulfate, right? That is going to be our selective ingredient. It's a detergent. It's there to inhibit gram positive, but allow for gram negative growth because a coliform is a gram negative bacteria that ferments lactose to produce acids and gas. You want to know that the multiple tube fermentation test is your confirmatory test. This is what's going to confirm if, in fact, the water contains coliforms. And so this would give you with high certainty that it is, in fact, a coliform. You want to know that this two, or this broth would have a durum tube in it, and the durum tube is there to detect the presence of gas because, again, we're seeing if bacteria can ferment lactose to produce acids and gas, and so the gas is, is detected using the durum tube. You want to study the, again, in the endo auger, you don't need to know all the ingredients, but you should know the differential and selective ingredients. So the lactose would be your differential ingredient because, again, you're determining if bacteria 
can ferment the lactose because we're looking for coliform. Your sodium sulfite and your basic fusion, those two ingredients are both selective. They both inhibit gram positive, but allow for gram negative growth because again, we want gram negative bacteria to grow because we're trying to detect coliforms. You also want to know the other purpose of these two ingredients. They serve another purpose as well. And that is the sodium sulfite is going to darken with acetaldehyde. So if bacteria utilize the lactose, they will produce acetaldehyde. And if they produce acetaldehyde, it's going to cause those colonies to darken. And so darker colonies tell us that lactose was metabolized. And so that's what the sodium sulfite tells us. The basic fusion is a dye and it will cause the colonies to change color if the pH goes down. So if the bacteria is a slow fermenter, the colonies are gonna stay this dark pink red uh, because you don't get this dramatic change in pH. However, if you see the colonies turn a metallic green sheen. That happens because the basic fusion, when the organism is a rapid fermenter, it's gonna decrease the pH, which causes the basic fusion to give this kind of metallic green sheen. So you wanna know the purpose of sodium sulfite and basic fusion, not only as a selective ingredient, but what is their other purpose as well? Because that has a role in how you interpret your readout. So those are what you wanna study for your endo auger. I just put this in here because again, the acetaldehyde in alcoholic fermentation is gonna be your final electron acceptor and that the sodium sulfite is going to darken if acetaldehyde is produced. And what that tells us again is that lactose was metabolized. So that is gonna tell you that lactose is metabolized. You want to know what does it mean to say that media is selective or an ingredient is selective? What does it mean to say that media is differential? And then for the different medias that we've talked about selective and differential ingredients, you want to know what are the selective ingredients? What is the differential ingredients? A good hint for differential ingredients in our coliform tests, so in our water sample testing, lactose is always the differential ingredient because that's what we're distinguishing it from other gram-negative bacteria. So keep that in mind. Your membrane filter, your endo auger, lactose is always differential. Selective is different. So endo auger has different selective ingredients than LTB, which has different selective ingredients than BGLB, which you'll see in a minute. So for these tests starting for this unit about water sample testing, you're not studying biochemical sheets anymore. There are no biochemical sheets. What you're gonna study is the ingredients that are, that are selective and the ingredients that are differential. Those are what you wanna study for that part. You also wanna know what the different colors on the endo auger tell you. So again, if it grew, in any case where it grew, you know that it's gram negative. So no matter what color the colonies are, if it grew, it's gram negative. You want to know what it means if the colonies darken. So again, if it's either metallic green sheen or this dark pink red, right? That tells us that lactose was fermented. And then if the, if the organism was a rapid fermenter, right? If it was a rapid fermenter, that means that it decreased the pH, which caused the colonies to have the metallic green sheen. You would want to know that if it's metallic green sheen, that is presumptive E. coli. The disease that goes with that is a urinary tract infection, and this metallic green sheen would be positive for being a coliform because it is a gram-negative bacteria. It does ferment lactose, and it produces the acids. The dark pink red, again, it's gram-negative because it grew. It darkened with acetaldehyde, which means that it fermented the lactose, but it didn't turn metallic green sheen because the pH did not lower yet. If you waited a little bit longer, it likely would. Um, but the fact that it darkened tells you that the lactose was used, but it's a slow fermenter of lactose. 
And that result would tell you presumptive club CLL pneumonia. And the disease that goes with that would be pneumonia. You want to know what light pink colorless um, tells you. So again, it's grew, it grew. So it's gram negative. We know that it's gram negative. It did not darken with acetaldehyde, which means that it did not ferment the lactose. Instead, it used peptones. And then you want to know what organisms those are presumptive. And that this light pink and colorless, that is negative for coliforms, right? Negative for coliforms because they didn't use the lactose. No growth, right? If you see no growth on a membrane filter, no growth tells you that the only conclusion you can make based on just that alone is that there was no gram negative bacteria. Again, I can't say that there's no bacteria because the endo auger will only allow gram negative growth. So if I see no growth on the membrane filter, all I can say is that there's no gram negative bacteria in the water. I would have to use a nutrient auger plate to determine if there's any bacteria. And so you want to study the slide and what do all these colors mean? What do they tell you? Which colors are positive for coliforms? Which ones are negative? and why. And so again, this is just showing you the different examples. So E. coli, which is a coliform, the colonies darken with the metallic green sheen. Um, Club CL pneumoniae, the colonies are this dark pink red. Um, KP is a coliform as well. The one that's not a coliform in this case is Alcaligenes faecalis. If you look closely, you can see little dots there but they're not dark in color, which means they did not ferment the lactose, which tells us that those are not coliforms. Oh, skip that one, I already went over. You wanna know what is the positive and what is the negative in the laurel tryptose broth, right? And the positive in the LTB was turbidity, right? So growth plus gas, because you get gas if the lactose is metabolized. The negative in LTB is either no growth, right? So no growth means there's no gram negative bacteria in the water. The other negative is that if you see growth, but no gas. Growth, but no gas is also a negative. What that means is that the bacteria is gram negative, but it's not a coliform because it didn't ferment the lactose to produce the gas. So for this one, you want to know what does the positive look like, what does the negative look like, and why. You want to know that if you get a positive in your LTB, you're going to then subculture that into a BGLB broth. So you would use your aseptic technique and transfer bacteria and inoculate uh, BGLB. You want to know... Um, what ingredients are uh, differential. So lactose would be differential. You would want to know that oxgal, which is bile, um, and brilliant green dye, these are both selective. They're there to inhibit gram positive, but allow for gram negative. And again, a good rule of thumb is if it's a coliform test, the ingredients in there are always going to inhibit gram positive because we want gram-negative bacteria to grow. So these two ingredients are selective. They inhibit, um, they inhibit the gram-positive bacteria growing. So if you were to look at the result, the next slide, if you were to look at the result, you want to know what is a positive and what is a negative. So the positive in your BGLB is turbidity, so growth plus gas. So if you see this little gas in the Durham tube, that is going to be positive for BGLB. And so if you got a positive LTB and a positive BGLB, that would be confirmatory for your coliforms in the water. The negative, remember, would be either no growth, because that means there's no gram negatives, or the other negative that you could have, just like the LTB, the other negative would be um, growth, but no gas. Growth because it's gram negative, but no gas tells you it's not a coliform because it didn't ferment the lactose to produce the gas. So you wanna know for the multiple tube fermentations, 
What does the positive test look like? What does the negative test look like? What are the selective ingredients? What are the differential ingredients? So that's what you wanna take away from this part. So when you're studying for your protozoans, you are going to study your protozoan table. You don't need the parasites eating us alive video, but you do need the protozoan table. And so in the table, you're gonna find this information. You need to know the disease that it causes, the mode of transmission, the infective stage, the mode of motility, symptoms, treatment, method of diagnosis, and stages in the life cycle, cyst and troph. And so you want to use the pictures that are in the PowerPoint for each protozoan and study those because those are the ones that you're gonna need to identify on the exam. And so you're gonna study each of those pictures and study the table and you could be tested on any of the protozoans for any of these aspects.